first of all, I would like to thank the Society for the Preservation of Greek Heritage for the invitation. I have to admit it's my first time in the US and the first time in Washington, so I'm thrilled to be here. And I also would like to uh, uh, say a special thanks to Alkistoyas, who has uh, stood, who stood up to the to all this process, bring me here from from Crete. It wasn't easy. And all of you, Kalispera, kiris kikiri, ευχαριστώ που είστε εδώ. And I would like to thank you all for being here. So my presentation will be about the evolution of Greek-owned shipping in the 18th and 19th centuries. I think I'm here to cover the gap between ancient times and modern Greek shipping. So I will try to do my best doing that. So what brings us here all today? I think that the success of Greek-owned shipping in the 20th century is the reason that we are all here to be honest. Uh, this is the reason why I started studying maritime history. And I think that all these guys that appear in the first, uh, in the front, uh, the front page of all these magazines and newspapers are the reason that Greek-owned shipping are so well known to, the, to the, uh, its corner, its, uh, the edge of the, of the earth. So we have here Anasis, of course, we have Nyarchos, but there are many others. So too much ink has been spilled uh, over the lives of these guys, of these businessmen, great businessmen. And many people, both in the social, in, in all social fora, uh, both academic as well as, uh, as public, has tried to offer an explanation. What is the reason of this guy's success? We have plenty of explanations ranging from rags to riches stories. Okay, these are not like uh, uh, people belonging to a community, a business community. These are individual stories, very successful ones, but just a few examples. Or other types of explanation like the genetic predisposition of Greeks to master the sea. As a historian, as an economic historian, I will try to offer a more scientific and reasonable explanation. We have, uh, of course, I will not, uh, I'm, I don't agree to take all the credit for, for this information that I will provide you because I'm not, I'm not alone, I'm working in a research group for many years now, and this is the work uh, that all my colleagues in this group have done, and I'm here to represent them all. So what is the, histo what is the historical basis for what is known as the, leg the, the legendary flexibility and market sense of Greek ship owners? I know this slide might seem a little weird. What uh, a guy with this weird uniform has to do with Nyarchos. Um, what I'm trying here to, to suggest is that there is a continuity in Greek on shipping from the 18th century till the, 19th, the 20th century, and that I'm going to, to exhibit today. When I'm talking about continuity, I'm not talking about inter intergenerational succession. I'm not talking about uh, um, uh, 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 a linkage, uh, uh, a lineage between all these people. I'm talking about the business community that was formed and persisted, and the, transmis the transmission of knowledge, norms, and practices, and all the social capital gathered by Greek ship owners from the 18th century up until this day. All the research done uh, uh, about Greek-owned shipping from the 18th to the 20th century has led us to this, this, this assumption. We have located two phases of international expansion and development of Greek-owned shipping. It starts, the first phase starts in the early 18th century and uh, ends 
uh, up until the beginning of the Greek War of Independence, while the second phase starts at 1830, which is well known as the year of the establishment of the Greek state, and leads, up, and leads us up to the First World War. What we have here is the evolution of a system. We start with the creation of a transport system based on the Eastern Mediterranean and spreading through the world. And we have the transition in the 19th century to an organized business system with a, a very um, a connected and coordinated commercial and shipping activities. We have the spread, the geographical spread of Greek ship owners from the Ottoman and Venetian Empire to Europe uh, uh, and Americas by the creation of diaspora communities. All these uh, uh, conclusions have been produced through wide, big, large research projects, which has been funded, as said before, by the Greek, gov the Greek government and European Union and concerned the collection of all the information, the data of the traveling of Greek ships through the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean from, a, from a 1700 up until 1914. So we have one database which is called Amphitrite. Amphitrite is a collection of all the, the, the voyages of Greek ships, no matter what the flag was, through the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean, we have around 15,000 uh, voyages for that period of time. And then we have Pontoporia, which is a database that actually registers, it's the historical registry of Greek owned ships. So it's not about voyages, it's about ships. It records uh, its ship has been. Uh, uh, appearing in either a European market or uh, a Greek, uh, the Greek registry of ships, and there we have around 11,000 ships, both sailing as well as steamships. So this is uh, the data that we have been working and led us to this, this uh, 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 periodization. But before Analyzing a bit more on the system, let's talk a bit about the context, the historical context. Okay, we are in the 18th century. This is the age of empires. Europe's map at that period looks something like this. Okay, this map is uh, 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 of, of 1812. However, this picture does not change as much. As we can see, the place that Today, Greece is standing is under the Ottoman rule. However, the Ionian Islands are um, uh, part of the, Ven the Venetian state. So the Greek Orthodox population at that time were subjects either to the Venetian or the Ottoman empires. As we can see, Uh, through the database, through the Amphitrite, we can see that for at least the first half of the 18th century, the number of voyages are rising but not exploding. But after 18, 1780, you can see that the voyages are at least four times uh, uh, greater, larger, more than the first period. So what is going on? Uh, at that specific period, what is the thing that makes these people, the, the Greek Orthodox population, either under the Ottoman rule or the Venetian rule, uh, uh, travel so much in the Mediterranean? First of all, first of all, this period is a very uh, important period for the rise of Greek shipping because at uh, 1789, we have the explosion of the Fre French Revolution. And of course, what follows are the Napoleonic Wars and the Napoleonic Blockade. So what happens with, and what is the relation of the Greeks with this? The Greeks, as subjects of the Ottoman state, are, uh, have the privilege to use the Ottoman flag. The Ottoman Empire at that time, at that period of time, is actually a neutral power. 
So under the Ottoman flag, throughout that period, the period of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, Greeks are able to travel and uh, arrive at European ports covering for the British and French naval powers that are absent from the Mediterranean due to confrontation in the open seas. However, the Greeks have not been using just the Ottoman flag. One of our greatest things, the things that we have revealed through our research, is the use, the early use of flags of convenience. You should all, I mean, if you have a relation with the sea, you should all know that this is one of the main mechanisms, the main tools of modern shipping. Registering your ship under a different registry because of uh, 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 better condition, tax conditions, and so on and so forth. So this is not something invented in the 20th century. This is actually something that, re that Greeks, either Ottoman or Venetian, were using, but not to avoid tax, uh, uh, the tax system of the Ottoman Empire, but to protect themselves from actual danger of destruction. Pirates, um, um, uh, wars, all this, all this, all the situation should be could be avoided by the use of a neutral flag, for example. I heard before about the use of the Russian flag. This was actually a great. Um, 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 it surprised us all when we we we've seen that actually the Russian flag was not so much used in the Mediterranean trade. This is more like this was more like a tool to put pressure on the Ottoman government on the on the on the Pili, on the Porta, to uh, achieve better conditions for the, those maritime populations, for these maritime businesses. So that's what one of the conditions, one of the factors that helped the growth of Greek owned shipping at that period of time. The other one is the special relations of Greek, city, of Greek <coughs> Ottoman subjects or Venetian subjects is the relation with the foreign merchant communities. At that time, of, at that period of time, the Mediterranean is actually controlled by the French merchant communities. They are really, they are the best established communities in Eastern Mediterranean Basin. They have created networks and they are trading for, them, from, for themselves. However, when the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars burst, these communities are actually excluded from Mediterranean trade. Greeks have also, uh, throughout the 18th century, have created merchant relations with all these communities. There is, there is a reason why. First of all, imagine a French or a British merchant trying to make trade in Eastern Mediterranean of that period, having to face Ottoman officials, uh, having to bribe Ottoman officials to make your trade, trying to explain or prove that the merchandise that reached the port of Smyrna, for example, is yours and not somebody else. So well, the, the Greeks were actually pretty useful for this. Um, they faced what is called the liability of foreignness, the danger of being a stranger in a new environment with no institutional context to protect you, with no international law, uh, with no actually even established ports. So these foreign merchants, the British, the French, the Swedish, the, um, the, the, the merchants from the Netherlands needed an agent, a local agent, who knew the language, who knew the religion, who knew the culture, who could navigate them through the Ottoman rules and practices. And these were actually the Greeks. Using all these networks, all these connections, uh, their, speci their, spe their special connections with international merchant communities, using the, neut using the neutrality of their flags, they actually achieved an explosion in both their ships and in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, their participation in international trade in the Mediterranean. 
you can see here the annual average of the fleet of Greek uh, uh, Orthodox population between 1700 and 7 and 1810. Uh, As you can see there, it's eight times bigger. It grew eight times in 100 years. We are talking about 945 vessels of 120,000 tons, which are fully equipped, carrying guns, carrying cannons, for the protection of piracy, of course. Of course, it's, it's, all of this are used afterwards in the Greek War of Independence. Uh, so fully armed ships that are carrying 17,000 men, uh, seamen. But where are they coming from and where are they going? This is a map of the Aegean. You have seen it once today, but under a different period. It looks a bit different at that time. So in this map, what, what we see are uh, the districts of what we call the maritime city. So it's a marble of, of islands, as uh, previous speakers said. Uh, and what you can see here is actually the communication and the clustering of this maritime, of this maritime centers, of these ports. So what you see, the, um, the, the division between them is based on the density of the interaction between ports within a specific area. As we can see, the eastern, the eastern Aegean has many different clusters, with bigger one, the cluster of Psara and um, uh, the, the cluster of Hios and Chesmet. On the center Aegean, we can see the cluster of Tinos, of Mykonos, of Sandorini as the biggest one. We can see on the western uh, Aegean, the cluster of Spetses, of Idra, uh, of Skopelos, and of course the Ionian Sea, which is the mother of Greek shipping. We can see how many clusters and how developed they are um, uh, early in the 18th century. We can see Cephalonia, Zakynthos, Ithaki, Lefkada, uh, Mesologi, Galaxidi. So these are actually the crandles of Greek owned shipping, and they start as early at the, as the 18th century. These, these islands existed before and interacted with each other. They traded, but they traded in local trades. What changed uh, in the 18th century? is that these islands have actually uh, have, have uh, broken this, this line, this local and regional line of trade, and started to engage in international trade. More than 1,800 shipping families uh, are, uh, uh, are own, own and trade uh, in all of these islands in, the 18, in 1810, in more than 40 of them, with more than 1,000 seagoing vessels. What exactly are, is the function of this fleet? The main function of the fleet is connecting the networks, the inland networks, with the maritime, the main maritime routes. Here, in this map, we can see the connections of the Aegean Sea with the, the, the networks, the trading networks of the hinterland of Asia. This is actually the, the period where isolated and fragmented merchant networks are linked to each other. We have the linkage between the Eurasian trade, the Balkan trade, and the trade of the trading networks of continental Europe. This is one part, this is the part of, the, of Asia. And you can see here the hinterland and maritime networks of Central Europe, of continental Europe, and uh, Central and uh, Western Mediterranean. But this is not something new. This is something that already, it's already said. If someone reads the community archives of the island of Hydra, 
1798, uh, a very well-known uh, uh, ship owner says, our ships do not only work in the White Sea, the Aegean Sea, but in all seas of the Levante, Eastern, which is the Eastern Mediterranean, and Ponente, which is the Western Mediterranean, and beyond the Straits in the ocean, in America, in Holland, which is Netherlands, and in England, in the Baltic Sea, and last year, merchants asked for our ships to be chartered for India. So you can see that the expansion does not only have to do with the Eastern Mediterranean or even with the Mediterranean, it has gone far beyond that. This is actually the visualization of this interlinkage of commercial networks that I've said before. So we have a local fleet, a regional fleet, coming from Eastern Mediterranean, trying and establishing connections to other several regional fleets in Central Mediterranean, and finally creating a connection to the Atlantic trade, reaching and going all the way to Britain. Many conditions have helped this, this expansion. One of these is the, um, the, the, the treaty, the commercial treaty between the Spanish Empire and the Ottoman Empire in the, in the last 20 years of the, of the 18th century. During that period, after the sign of the treaty, from 1797 up until 1808, we can find more than 400 Ottoman Greek ships traveling to the Imperial, Imperial ports, and then traveling through Gibraltar and reaching Britain, but also Buenos Aires, Montevideo, Martinica, Guadalupe, and Providence. We can see that Greeks in the 18th century, in the last 25 years of the 18th century, have not just uh, passed the border of Eastern Mediterranean, not just the border of, of the Mediterranean, but they have reached, they have crossed the ocean. But how could they do that with that small ship of 100, 150 tons? How could they cross the ocean? Um, the main thing is that they used to follow, due to these commercial treaties, they were treated as neutral ships, and they were allowed to follow the convoys of both uh, the merchant, but also of military ships from other nations. So they used to follow the convoys of Spanish ships crossing the ocean. And this was the way that they could see the routes. Think that at this period of time there were no maps, no instruments, no tools to use. So they were doing everything by experience. They were trying to imitate other, other ships, to learn through their routes. And this is how they reached, um, uh, for the first time, the, uh, the Americas. But they were also the intermediate ships for trade done by the British. So Greeks have a, had a very special relation with the, the British Empire. Um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, there was the Levant Company. This was a chartered, a monopoly company of, of, of the British Empire, which actually directed and regulated all trade with the Eastern Mediterranean. During uh, at that period of time, from uh, 1780 up until uh, 1820, Greeks had managed to penetrate and become members of the Levant, of the Levant Company. So they were actually treated not just as protected uh, uh, local merchants, but as equal members of a British company, with all the 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 um, um, with all the privileges and all the advantages that this uh, standard for. And then. We have the Greek War of Independence 
Uh, but first we have the, the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So all this golden period, all this period of extreme growth for Greek road shipping stopped like that. Uh, first, the international trade uh, uh, stops in 1815 with the end of the Napoleonic Wars. But then you have a, a, the, the Greek War of Independence, which actually blocked trade even in the, inside the Eastern Mediterranean. The 19th century, however, um, triggered all this type of changes, both locally as well as internationally. Locally, we have in, in 1830, when the, the war ended, we have the establishment of the Greek state. We are talking about a territory which is one third of the territory that the Greek state has today. The Ionian Islands, on the other hand, are not independent, are not under the Ottoman rule, they are actually under the British control. Many of the Aegean Islands that actually flourished in, in shipping and trade in the previous period, like Chios, Kassos, or Psara, are not only uh, left outside the borders of the Greek state, but they are actually also devastated by the war, and their populations have fled to the Greek uh, territory. In spite of the changes in the, in the local context, we have also changes in the international context, which affected the evolution of Greek road shipping. This has to do with uh, the Industrial Revolution, the spread of industrialization, the change of an economic era that deeply affected international uh, trade system as well. As we start from, from Britain moving to the east, industrialization has led to urbanization, to rise of population, which means more foodstuff, more demand for raw materials. Up to that point, at the beginning of the period, when Britain was the, the, the most industrialized nation, uh, the, the demands in grain and raw material were covered by mostly continental Europe. As you see in the diagram, Central and Western Europe covered the demand of Britain in wheat in more than 70%. Uh, but during the last, the, the second half of the 19th century, the continental uh, system actually breaks down. This is due to the rise of population and urbanization, as we've said before. So the continental system of providing foodstuff for its own population does not work anymore. That leads European nations to search for new sources of wheat, of grain, outside this closed system. And what is the first re area that they look for is Russia. Russia is well known for the very fertile land, the Ukrainian land, the Russian land, very fertile for the production of wheat. As you can see during the second half of the 19th century, you can start to see the southern and northern Russia as a very important provider of grain for the world. But this is not enough, but this is not enough. As we can see, as industrialization moved from Britain to the other European nations, the demand in which, in which sort. So what, what this triggered, this triggered, this sent a signal, a signal to the agrarian economies all over the world that they could produce uh, grain, that they could produ produce foodstuff for the developed nations, and this way they could uh, skip, they could um, uh, become uh, a part of the developed, of the developed uh, global economy that was in rise. Uh, in this diagram you can see the, the main producing markets of grain in the world for the period 1860 up until 1914. What you can see is that Russia remained the main producer of grain for the world economy up until the First World War, but it is closely competed by the US. So we have 
uh, here the rise of new markets, the globalization of the uh, merchant system, of the international merchant system, and Russia it's, it is, is at the center of this transformation. So the Greeks step in. They have the transport systems, they have the ports, the infrastructure, the fleet, the people to man those ships, but they need a stable trading base. What they do is that they create diaspora communities. And where do they place them? They place them in the main markets of this luxurious new trade, the grain trade. So they are close to Russia. They have already communities in Russia since the late 18th century. What they do is that they multiply these communities. They actually reach uh, many ports. We have located more than 20 ports that Greek diaspora communities are, uh, uh, are established in the 19th century in the southern coast of Russia. We are talking about Odessa, Taganrog, Rostov, um, um, uh, uh, ports in Crimea, uh, Sevastopol. Um, we are talking about ports in Bulgaria, Varna, Burgas. We are talking about ports in the Danube, Sulina, Galatz. So 21 new port cities are built and Greeks are monopolizing this trade. They use their connections with Britain to create trading communities in Western Europe. This is the trading network of, of Greek merchant and shipping businesses in the 19th century. So we are talking about uh, many different hubs. Of course, we have three main hubs at that period. One in the Black Sea. There are more than 30 uh, families established there, interconnected. They have firms. Uh, uh, they create firms collaborating to each other. They are spread throughout the Black Sea. We have a second very important community in Marseille, which is a, a, a very um, important commercial hub of that period of time, and of course, they use their connections to establish a luxurious merchant community in Britain, in London. 61 families are established there, well connected to each other, and handling the trade that comes from Russia uh, and uh, uh, spreading and, and uh, uh, buying and supplying the local market. What is very interesting is the way that Greek firms um, uh, choose to situate themselves, both in Russian uh, port cities as well as in, in, in major Western uh, cities like London or Marseille. Here is Finsbury Circus. This is a neighborhood uh, in London. And you can see that Greek firms are actually established around a square. It's like creating, it's, it's a cluster within a cluster. London, I have to remind you, at that period of time is the main financial center of the world, the main merchant uh, trading center of grain of the world. So Greeks, what they do is that they create a cluster within this environment. They create a cluster to each other. They build, they, they establish firms collaborating with each other. And of course, they are living with each other. Of course, here you can see very important names like Rodokanakis, Rallis, uh, Kasavetis, Skilitsis, uh, Argentis, Skuluvis, Ionidis. These are all Hyot merchants, mostly Hyot merchants. This system, this business system, the collaboration between those merchant communities and the shipping businesses from the islands actually produced this huge uh, development in the second half of the 19th century. We are talking about 
uh, 500, from 500 ships in 1840, rising up to 2,500 ships in the end of the century. So this is a dramatic growth. But if, you want, if we want to see exactly what that, does this mean for the economy of Greece at that time, we have here an estimation of the maritime income for that period of time as part of the Greek GDP. So between 1835 and 1914, okay, the participation of maritime income in, in, war, in uh, Greece's GDP is changing, of course. So it starts, uh, it's about 70% of, of the GDP at the beginning of the century, when the Greek GDP is really low, but then it reaches a more stable, a more stable percentage from 20 to 10 percent, from 10 to 20 percent of uh, uh, Greece's GDP. So this is really important. I don't know if, um, if you understand how big this, this is. And when we talk about continuity to finish with this, we should see the places, the people, uh, that uh, made Greek shipping what it is. So we have here the islands from the 18th century, the main maritime centers of, of Greek-owned shipping, uh, up to the 19th century. So we can see in the 18th century, Idra, Kephalonia, Psara, Galaxiti, Spetses, Mesologi, and Kassos. And in the 19th century, more or less on the top four, you can see the, the, the same islands. The only, the only change is, of course, Psara and Kassos, which do not exist anymore because of the devastation of the war, and have created the merging of these communities along with Hios, have created Syra, which was the first uh, important, the first biggest Greek port of the 19th century, which lasted for almost, almost uh, a century, uh, succeeded only by the port of Piraeus in the 20th. So, this has been all for me. Thank you. Thank you.